My name is Ronald Simowin. At the age of 38, I suddenly found myself alone in the world when I saw on Facebook that a cousin of mine had died. I had no relatives left, not one. I decided to hire a genealogy service to learn more about a couple of people I didn't know much about. The one who interested me most was an uncle I'd never met, Uncle Andrew. He'd done two tours in Vietnam and was discharged, but he died even before the last of the American troops were pulled out. The service found out that it had been a suicide, which I hadn't known, and they even gave me a short list of living men who had apparently served in his last unit. I decided to write to them all, just to learn more, as I was managing to accomplish with some other relatives. One of the men wrote me back, and he even said I could drive up to see him if I wanted to hear about Andrew. So one weekend, I made the three-hour trip up to Keating and met this guy named Porter. He lived alone in a small, dirty house, had a long, white beard. His emails were kind of terse and not written very well. And in person, he was a little cold, like maybe he'd changed his mind and I was intruding on him. Almost the first thing he did was take me down to his basement. And there was something there that was kind of hideous. At first I thought it was a big model train set. A few years back he had actually tried to recreate a mountain village that his infantry unit had passed through one morning. This was where my Uncle Andrew and some other guys had been badly hurt. Porter had bought fake terrain and hills and grass and moss and dirt and laid it all out very carefully. And there they were, the men who had been there that day. June 1st, 1969. Little plastic painted figures headed in a column down a path that went up a slight incline and ended at the village, which was just a few six-inch buildings made of wood and wicker and some huts that were part of a kit Porter had bought. I thought maybe this project had been suggested by someone as therapy, but no, he said. He just liked to make things. And that made it even stranger, standing there under a bare bulb beside him, looking at the little details. In his display, the unit was about five minutes away from the disaster that had hit them. It had been just after dawn and the village had been deserted, he said. They'd been suddenly surrounded by a weird, dry, gray mist blowing through. Dust and sand kicked up in a heavy, oppressive cloud, reducing their visibility. All they could hear was the bits of sand flitting off their helmets, their guns, like static electricity. Porter had been their CEO, and he'd commanded them to stop walking and stay close together until it blew over. They just stood there. Porter saw faces and silhouettes of his fellow soldiers for a few seconds, and then they were swallowed up again in the mist. He got so paranoid that he went down on one knee to feel safer, closer to the ground. Some of the others, including my uncle, did the same. Porter remembered hearing a strange bird screaming off in the distance, a sound not quite like one he'd ever heard before. And then a shape had run past them, seeming neither male nor female, and it hurled a sack in their direction. And there was a loud slapping sound, and Porter was knocked backwards by some kind of blast. He started to hear yelling and screaming. He would never forget a guy named Corporal Grieg. When they got to him, Grieg was leaning back against a hut, his chest torn open. But when he was approached by the medic or by anyone, he put a hand out and refused to let them come close. He said, stay back, all of you. No one touches me. I don't want the living touching me. He was obviously in deep shock, but he began to actually fight people off. And a few seconds later, he was dead. My Uncle Andrew had been hit in the stomach and he was rushed to a mobile hospital. The surgeon saved his life. But then, Porter said, they'd made it worse. Andrew had come awake during the surgery because the anesthesia hadn't been calculated right. He actually felt the doctors pulling, tugging at his insides, that there was no real pain, only intense pressure, but he heard the sounds of his body's components being shifted this way and that, 
His eyes were taped shut, and he'd been paralyzed by the anesthesia, and he had no way of even lifting a finger or blinking to let them know what was happening. His mind was screaming desperately, but they never knew, and he was caught in that hell for many minutes. At some point, he lost consciousness again. Porter had been his friend, and so he knew the whole story. My uncle was a basket case from the moment he woke up in post-op. They had to keep him under heavy sedation because he would flail about so bad it threatened to destroy the work they'd done on his stomach. He was flown back to the States, and on the trip over, he became catatonic. They managed to get him out of it, but after his wound healed, he went into heavy therapy. Porter arrived back in the States two months after my uncle, and he went to see Andrew at the VA. Porter knew my uncle wasn't going to make it the second he saw him. Andrew had lost a ton of weight. He couldn't ever lie down to go to sleep because he had horrific visions of the surgery. I'll show you something, Porter said, and he brought out an old photo album he dug from his archives after I'd written to tell him I was coming. Uncle Andrew's dreams had been filled with the sight of the man who'd given him the anesthesia back in Vietnam, even though he'd never seen his whole face. And he would draw that face sometimes. From the photo album, Porter handed me a yellowed, torn piece of notebook paper. My uncle had truly drawn the face of a vampire, a man with strange eyes and a sharp nose and teeth like shards of glass. That's him, he would say to Porter in the hospital. If you see him on the street, I have to know. He was in and out of the VA when he wasn't living with a girlfriend who tried to take care of him. He began to keep a diary in October of 1970. Porter had read it all, and he'd kept it so no one else would read it. Andrew's insomnia was chronic. He couldn't work. He could barely eat. He became paranoid, and he wanted to keep a gun with him. His final descent began on one winter's night when he was tossing and turning in his room. He'd gone downstairs to make himself some tea, and he got as far as the hallway that led to the kitchen when he saw something in the pitch dark, which froze him. There were three shapes there, and he saw that they were trees of varying heights, with the tallest being about seven feet high, but they had no tops or branches. They each tapered off at the top as if someone had chopped away whatever had once been there. They stood right there in the hallway. Silent, almost featureless. Andrew had backed out of the room and gone back to his chair in his bedroom. Porter and I were out in his backyard by the time he told me this part, sitting in folding chairs as the dusk came. I asked him, what did those trees mean? They were the surgeons, Porter said. Andrew had heard three voices when he'd awoken under the anesthetic voices talking during the progress of the surgery and Porter was pretty sure those trees were how Andrew perceived them at that point, as dark things that wouldn't help him just hold power over him. The diary entries got more random and fractured as time went on, and then at some point Andrew had killed himself. I asked Porter where and how, but he said he didn't know. He was lying, and I knew it, but I didn't press him. I could get that information easily enough. For two more hours, he told me about some of the better times the two of them had had, but that all just couldn't stay with me as much as what Andrew had experienced there on the operating table and what it had done to him. I gave the genealogists more money, and it wasn't long before they came up with what I wanted. A notice in the Straw Keller newspaper dated January 11th, 1971, about a body found in the woods near something called Grocer's Pond. A suicide, a man named Andrew Simowin. A single gunshot to the head. Why there, I wondered. It was close to where he'd been living, but not that close. I've been accused of having an obsessive personality sometimes, and I really needed to know what had happened, just as I felt I needed to know why a distant great aunt had once been tried in Connecticut for corrupting the morals of a minor. So I drove to the little town of Straw Keller. Late one cold gray afternoon, I parked my car and I walked a half mile into the woods. The grocer's pond was only twice the size of a baseball diamond, really. I walked all around it, thinking of my uncle. There must have been something about this place that had drawn Andrew. 
No walking paths were near, and it seemed too close to some houses to be a hunting spot. The pond had no significance in history that I knew about. The water in the pond was black and still murky. It was only when it was starting to get dark and I was headed back to my car that I saw it, looking to my left. In what could not quite be described as a clearing, just a slight break in the foliage. There were three short trees close together, their branches and tops gone, chopped away. They had been treated with oil and sealant to preserve them against the elements year after year. A small stone plaque had been built into the earth before them. This was a small, almost secret monument, built in the year 1955, to the three victims of a school fire in Straw Keller. This is where Andrew had done it. I felt confident about that. Maybe he'd knelt before them. Whether he had seen this monument before he'd begun to be tormented by its image, or he'd stumbled across it long after, crystallizing his agony perfectly, his diary apparently never said. Those trees were so featureless, so dark, so silent. They were whatever was projected onto them, but more somehow. It was full night when I finally went away from there. There came a Sunday not long ago when I was out kayaking alone near Deacon Falls. I was skirting the edge of some grade four rapids, trying to push myself a little, when I realized things were getting way too rough and I slowed myself pretty suddenly. Turning in the kayak, I caught sight of something coming at me out of nowhere from behind another kayak that looked like it had no rower. I yelled out and it struck me and the force knocked the handle of my paddle back against my forehead hard. I blacked out for a second, but I heard the sound of that kayak hitting mine, sending it sideways. I recovered just in time to keep myself from flipping over into the rapids. The other kayak skewed sideways and was carried on down the river, headed for the falls, and nothing was going to keep it from going over 200 yards away. I tried to focus on keeping afloat as waves of dark and light alternated and I came close to passing out again. Barely conscious, I managed to steer myself out of the roughest patch and finally make it to the shoreline where I crawled out of the kayak and collapsed, clutching my head, blood all over my hands. Some people were camping very close by and they helped me up into the hospital. I was kept overnight and they had to give me a lot of tests. I responded just well enough to where they couldn't really keep me. I was literally gathering my clothes when two police officers came in to speak to me. A badly damaged kayak had been found at the bottom of the falls, and so had a human body. Before the horror of that could sink in, they explained things to me. Someone had stabbed a man to death, an accountant who lived near the river. His wife had already been arrested. It turned out she'd hired someone to do it and dispose of the body so she could collect his life insurance and run away with her lover. They believed the body had been placed into that kayak and pushed down the river. So it had most likely been in the kayak, stuffed into it, when it collided with mine. I couldn't tell them anything, of course, and the whole thing never came up again. It was only a bizarre epilogue to my injury. I slept poorly the next two nights, and I suffered a couple of pretty bad headaches as a result of my concussion. I dreamt of those trees beside Grocer's Pond, dreamt I was lying on my back, strapped down between them, looking up at them, upside down. They towered over me. The sky above them swirled with dark clouds. After a full week away from work, the headaches seemed to be subsiding, but on the bus going there on Monday morning, the worst one of all came very suddenly. I wound up having to get off and walking into the first dark place I saw, which was a very old and very small laundromat on a side street, one that seemed totally empty. It had a couple of chairs and a soda machine, so I bought a ginger ale and I sat there, dizzy, trying to calm myself, worried I might be getting worse. Exactly one machine was active, a dryer, but no one was in sight. What happened 
happened no more than five minutes after I sat down. The front window looked out on a quiet street, and looking through it I noticed the wind pick up. Very quickly the visibility through the glass became tinted, and some kind of light, low cloud moved in from the east, like a fog rolling over the street. There came a hesitant tapping sound on the glass, like a thousand tiny stones brushing it, and I saw it was not fog out there, but a cloud of dust that became more and more dense. I'd never seen anything like it. In a horrible way, I was reminded of the videos of 9-11, the billowing waves of debris darkening the streets. The cloud blocked out most of the daylight, and 60 seconds later, I couldn't even see the cars parked out there. It was so quiet, that was maybe the scariest thing. Aside from the dirt ticking against the window, no sound at all. Something else came from the east. It came down the sidewalk, just outside the window. It was a wheeled gurney, a hospital gurney. As if someone unseen had pushed it, it rolled on wobbly wheels and stopped out there just a few feet away. I could even see a small tear in one of the flat cushions. It was that close as the dust drifted over and passed it. The cloud began to dissipate. When other objects started to become visible again, a fire hydrant, the sign on the used bookstore across the street, the wind blew up once more and the gurney was pushed on. It bumped against the side of the building and was angled back down the sidewalk. It rolled past the window and it was gone. Within seconds, the dust seemed to follow it. A car passed by. It was just the street again, like before. At some point during the episode, the dryer far behind me had stopped. When my hands stopped shaking, I left the laundromat, and I got on a bus and I went home. No sign of that gurney. My head felt better. I sat in a chair with a cup of coffee for hours, trying to picture it all the way it had happened, as many times as it took to confirm to myself that it had been real. I found I was less stressed the next three nights, and I could get to sleep faster if I sat upright in a chair. Lying down made me paranoid. When I was lying down, I felt vulnerable, and I became convinced I'd dream of those trees again. The phone call I expected came very shortly after that, It was Dr. Stavros Katsaros, the man who had released me from the hospital. He wanted to talk about the rather startling things that had been noticed in my family medical history. It was something I'd never given them, but they'd found out about it anyway. I should have given a false name at the emergency room so they couldn't research all that electronically. But I hadn't been thinking correctly. Now, Dr. Katsaros started asking me lots of questions about how I was feeling, and he was trying to get me to come back for more tests and to fill out a more complete medical history. And I did return for those tests. When Katsaros asked me why I had been reluctant to volunteer my family history, I told him I'd had enough of people trying to save me. If the aggressive, sinister strain of mental illness that had destroyed almost everyone in my family before they reached the age of 45 was going to come for me, so be it. I would not be studied like a freak. I didn't care how much could be learned from me. I just wanted to be left alone. He pretended to be patient with me, but I could sense his frustration. He was a young guy in his mid-thirties, maybe, with cold blue eyes, almost gray eyes, a shaved head. Humorless, not one for talking much. Calculating, you might say. The tests were very expensive, but those costs would be taken care of, said Dr. Katsaros. Another MRI, a different kind this time, and something else involving some machine they had to explain to me. The results of the tests came back quickly. I had some minor tissue damage from the accident. Surgery would be advisable as soon as I could schedule it to make sure I wouldn't suffer a clot sometime down the road. My family history made the long-term results of my accident even more unpredictable. The frontal lobe was still a mystery to medical science. I told Dr. Katsaros about my uncle, 
and that I'd read the statistics about people coming awake under anesthetic, and I would never, ever allow myself to be put under. He said he understood, but I shouldn't worry, since it was becoming a more and more rare phenomenon. But he could not deny it was a possibility. True, he told me, what made us reach that twilight state under anesthesia, and why we came back from it, and what we really experienced during it, were all not quite understood. How, then, could I be assured that a resistance to anesthesia wasn't even genetic somehow? How did I know? How did I know I wasn't predisposed to waking up like my uncle did and then being driven slowly mad by the post-traumatic stress, haunted by visions and sounds of my body being manipulated, altered, invaded by hands I didn't know? Katsaros knew he was up against a will stronger than his. He wanted me to consider the surgery as possibly life-saving. I should be keenly on guard for any further worsening of the headaches or suicidal thoughts. He told me they would be a cue that this had become an emergency situation. I imagined that if I revealed what I had seen from inside the laundromat, he never would have let me leave the office. My head hurt very badly even as I was sitting there speaking to him, but I refused to let on. The pain made me lose focus a little on my way out of the building. I was on the third floor, which was split into three separate wings, and I wound up in radiology and then in a series of hallways that got more and more confusing. In one of them, there was a glass wall, and a sign on the door said this was anesthesiology. Dr. Micah Small. Katsaros had mentioned him. He told me this would be the man who would anesthetize me. He'd invited me to go speak to him to soothe my nerves. I stopped there for a moment, looking in. The reception area was dark, and the office seemed to be closed, but when I pulled on the door, it was open. I went in. There was a light on in the hallway that led deeper into the office, so I went that way. I walked past a couple of closed doors. This Dr. Small had framed a few things on the hallway walls, awards, and two pages from some article in some health industry magazine which featured a photo of him holding some medical device. I took a ride into the first open room I found. It looked a little like a regular examination room, but it was a lot bigger, lit harshly from above. A clock ticked on the far wall. Strange containers were ranked along high shelves and tall cabinets lined the walls. In the middle of it, there was only a gurney. It was like the one I had seen blown past by the wind when I was alone in the laundromat, but then weren't they all alike? There was an object sitting on this one. I found myself afraid to get closer to it, even though it seemed to be nothing more than an ordinary jar. I took two steps forward, just two and no more. It was all I could bring myself to do. The jar was filled halfway with sand, I knew I had seen it before. It was back in Porter's basement, sitting on his giant tableau representing that village in the central highlands of Vietnam. He'd used real sand to represent parts of the dry terrain, and there had been a closed jar of the stuff sitting nearby. I remember that vividly, and as soon as that memory came, I froze, staring at that jar trying to understand why I was so afraid of it. I turned and left, walked through the office, and found my way out of the building, needing a drink badly. The week of October 15th began my transition from mere insomnia into an active attempt to keep myself from falling asleep, to keep the nightmares away. It involved a lot of walking and a lot of pills, it was scary how intensely my body wanted me to sleep, though. Like something was within me, reaching up from a place in my spine no one had ever seen, reaching up into my throat and to a spot behind my eyes and pulling me down toward it. No matter the position of my body, no matter the location, eventually I simply passed out. Loud movies and loud music and pacing my freezing apartment were all just 
weak shields against that thing that knew how to make me sleep. I was afraid that once I would be so tight in its grip that Dr. Small would come to my home and since I was in bed with no way of waking and decide it was time to enter and come and take me to surgery. And then I would come awake just when Katsaros's scalpel was inside my brain. It felt inevitable. I needed no more signs that I was born to play out that script, to wake under anesthesia and be invaded by every sight, sound, and smell that had slowly killed my uncle. So every time I fell asleep was another chance for Small to condemn me to death. I didn't blame him. I blamed fate. On the 27th, I was in the grip of the worst headache yet when I realized my necessary next step. If I absolutely had to sleep, at least I could try to end the constant nightmares. It was one in the morning and I was wide awake. The temperature outside had dipped into the high 20s. I bundled up and I went out. From memory, I found my way in the car back to Straw Keller. Even in a state of exhaustion so advanced that I kept seeing nonsensical words in the highway signs, I got every turn correct. I bounced up and down sometimes in the car seat to get my blood moving and keep my eyes open. After two hours, I pulled the car into the little park I'd been to many weeks before and killed the engine and the lights. As soon as I was engulfed in darkness, I felt that hand reaching up inside my spine, up, to take me down. So I took another pill, something the guy I bought it from called Lagoon. And I got out of the car and into the sharp cold right away. I had an axe in the trunk, a big one I'd used sometimes when camping in the woods. I took it with me and I began to walk toward Grocer's Pond. The moon above was brilliant and it shone my way. With the axe in my hands and the wind in my face, I had a renewed energy. But halfway to my destination, fear made it go away. I hummed to myself, talked to myself. The leaves cracked under my feet and my ears and my face stung in a way I craved. I would not cower, my nerves would not fail. Those trees were still there, amongst all the normal ones, the ones with no tops, the three in a kind of semicircle, there as if waiting for me. If I hesitated, I would be overcome with fright, so I acted. I moved closer to the tree nearest me than I had ever dared in my nightmares. Being that close made me feel dizzy and panicked and my heart felt as if it would burst from my chest, but I closed my eyes and swung the axe as hard as I could. My hands thrummed as the head sunk into the wood. It took seven, eight, nine desperate hacks to strike blood, which appeared black. At first it only leaked out, viscous and repellent, but when I connected with the axe so deep into the wound I'd created that it nearly caused the tree to topple over, the blood sprayed out in a freezing coil, striking me in the face. Instead of terrifying me, it actually caused me to become stronger, my feet planted on the ground. I felt I was growing. The tree toppled over and I had won. Then I swung the axe at the second tree. My strikes were so profound that the blood began to spray from this one immediately. I would say that it took me 20 minutes to finish the job, but I may be very wrong. I seem to remember having to walk to the edge of the pond and splash water all over my face to get the blood out of my eyes, and then stumbling around lost for a long time, trying to regain my bearings before making it back to the trees. The important thing is that I did what I went there to do. The three of them lay harmlessly on the ground and I left the woods. I lost consciousness at the truck stop on the turnpike and didn't wake up for almost 12 hours, but my sleep was peaceful and wonderful. I agreed to the surgery on November 3rd for the sole purpose of meeting Dr. Micah Small. Now his office was fully lit and in front was a pleasant receptionist. There were the usual forms and the questionnaire one filled out to make sure the correct type and amount of anesthesia would be given. Then, sitting down with the doctor, 
He was a pale, quiet man. I asked him how many cases of anesthesia awareness he had encountered. He said he never had, only read about them in case studies. An obvious lie. He guaranteed me it wouldn't happen to me, explained at great length how the process supposedly worked. He wanted to arrange for me to talk to Dr. Katsaros that very day because I did not seem very well at all. I lied myself and claimed there had been no headaches recently, but I was not fool enough to try to deny I was operating on only the minimal sleep needed to live. I never told him just how little there had been. Maybe he suspected based on my appearance and the way I slurred my speech. Yes, I'll go see the doctor, I told him and left him. But when I stepped into the outer office, it was dark, like it had been that one day before. The receptionist was gone. When I turned around, the light in the hallway had gone out. I decided to go forward toward the corridor I'd been to before, but further this time. There was much to learn here, I knew, if I found the right hidden corners. When I went into the room where I'd seen the empty gurney and that curious jar of sand, things had changed. Now it opened up on the outside world, not on 16th Street, but on open country. A faint drizzle fell on a wide patch of sterile, scarred farmland nestled among the mountains. The sky over them was half white, half black with thunderclouds. The foliage in the far distance rustled secretly. Directly in front of me was a faded, beaten footpath leading to a collection of small huts of wicker and stone. I stepped through the doorway and into the clearing, following the path. Despite the drizzle, it was hot and humid. I heard the low buzzing of flies nearby, and that was all. I reached out and touched the lowest part of the roof of the first hut on my left. Turning to the left, just beyond it, I saw a man sitting on a handmade stone bench watching me. He was about my age, dressed inappropriately for the surroundings. Khaki pants and a white collared shirt with the sleeves rolled up. Before him on the ground was a soldier, lying face down. The grunt's hands were a ghastly white, as if he'd been dead for some time. His combat helmet was half on, half off his head. I asked the man on the bench who he was, and he told me his name was Grant Grayson, but he said that didn't matter. He had information for me. I had been wrong in trying not to sleep. I needed to do more to avoid the fate of waking up under the anesthesia. I told Grant Grayson I'd do anything. He said I had to take their power away from them, the power of these men who wanted to put me under. Take away their power and I'd be safe. Yes, that made perfect sense to me. And if I failed? Grayson laughed, a cruel, mocking laugh. Well, then, I would belong to the mid -off. I didn't know that word. Could he show me what that meant? Grayson rose off the bench. Come with me, he said. I'll show you the mid-off. What do you think it is that reaches up into your throat to pull you down to the place where the doctors can get you? He took hold of my arm near my elbow and he walked me toward one of the huts. But now I didn't want to go. I didn't want to see this awful thing, but he didn't let me go. When I tried to get away from him, he smiled and gripped me harder. Now I remembered that Grayson was the name of the man who had been killed and sent down the Round Top River to the falls and over them. I started to scream, but it seemed like we were alone in the village, utterly alone. The door of the hut he was taking me to was ajar. He pushed me in and he followed right behind. Someone was inside waiting for me. A person dressed in a blue surgical gown and mask. I recognized him instantly from photographs. Uncle Andrew. 
almost like we were on a game show. He unfurled his hand like a showman to display something on a gurney beside him, a jar half filled with sand. As I looked at it, the sand inside began to shift just a little. Some of it was displaced, and that space was quickly filled in, and another spot was then disturbed from within. The Medhoth was in there. This is where they kept it. It was trying to emerge, and if it did and broke through the top of that jar, it would have me. And so I put my hands to my temple and released my loudest scream yet, and that was what finally released me from the village and certain death. If you enter my little house on Jessup Road today, November 10th, which is the day I was supposed to report for my surgery, you'll find it's different from the way it used to be. The living room still seems the same in the kitchen, but if you turn on the light beside the basement stairs and go down, down, all the way down, that's when you notice what's new. I have a table ready for a man of average height, and I've bought enough ether online to anesthetize two of them easily. The surgical implements were not hard to buy since they're nothing too advanced or unwieldy. First I will try Dr. Micah Small, I think, and maybe Katsaros later. Their awful power over the sleeping will vanish, I see now, the moment they themselves wake during surgery, completely controlled by someone who is no longer afraid of them, and never again will they be able to threaten me or anyone else. Their power will be mine instead. But in addition to putting the patient under, there must then be a procedure. Otherwise it's pointless, no? That's the part I'm not sure of yet. How far in to cut and for what purpose and how much I can rearrange without going too far. Just something else to think about tonight when I get into the van and head into town. I'm very tired, but sleep is something I will not reward myself with until the surgery is done.